We are continuing the series on the seven potentially deadly church sicknesses. Thanks for joining me. My name is Tom Rayner, and I'm always glad to have you here. I am presuming, maybe, maybe it's, it's, it's a rash presumption, but I am presuming that uh, you have come here having heard and viewed the previous videos. The previous videos are just kind of an overview, and then I went through attitudinal angst, then I went through the slippage syndrome, and now we're going to look at the illness call detail distraction. Again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on all of them because we're diving deeper into each of them, but I do want to give you a reminder of the seven illnesses that we're covering. And as I give you this quick checklist of the seven, keep in mind that this is not an exhaustive list. These are some of the most common. In fact, I think they're the seven most common based upon the thousands and thousands of responses and questions that we've gotten from church leaders, but there are others as well. So don't think that as we're looking at church illnesses that we have gotten all of them on here, but these are some that we see as some of the most prevalent and most pervasive in churches, particularly across North America. So once again, as a reminder, the seven are attitudinal angst, slippage syndrome, what we'll be covering today, detailed distraction, institutional idolatry, activity acclamation, purposeless prayer, and detrimental defensiveness. I hope you appreciate the alliteration. It helps me to remember them a little bit better. Jonathan, who is a part of the production team on this, has said he just raised his hand as an, as an affirmation of this alliteration as well. Let's look at detailed distraction. What do we mean by detailed distraction when we begin to talk about that as an illness of the church? Well, I guess the best thing to do is define it. Detailed distraction defined. A church illness where there is too much focus on minor issues to the detriment of major issues. Church illness where there is too much focus on minor issues to the detriment of major issues. Now, is it possible that I don't have to say any more and all of a sudden your lights are going on or bells are ringing and you said, oh yeah, that's exactly what is happening in my church. Here is what we know about many churches today, ladies and gentlemen. There are a lot of churches that are doing good things, but they're not doing the best things. There's, there, there's a phrase that I wrote at the beginning of a book called Breakout Churches, and I said these words, it is a sin to be good when God has called us to be great. There is not a good commission, there is a great commission. There is not a good commandment, there is a great commandment. And when Paul writing in 1 Corinthians 13 talked about love, he didn't say it's one of these good things. He said the greatest of these is love. The greatest of these. Great commission. Great commandment. In many of our churches, the illness that we have is the focus on the minors to the detriment of the majors. Or focusing upon the things that have minimal value to the things that have true, significant, and eternal value value. When we begin to talk about detailed distraction, there are just all kinds of church issues that, that go through my mind. I've actually shared this on a podcast in the past. I was doing a consultation with the church, and the pastor asked me to meet him at church at, uh, I think, 6.30 or something one Sunday morning. He wanted me to shadow him, and so I shadowed him. It's really weird shadowing someone, and I just was walking around. First thing he does is go to the mailbox to get the Friday and Saturday mail. He goes to the mailbox to get the Friday and Saturday mail. He sits down at his desk and he starts dividing this big stack of mail, looking just at every single address on there, junk mail and all, dividing it up into different staff members, recipients, and putting it into different categories. And that exercise, as I looked over, about to fall asleep watching him, took about 45 minutes. To me, that was a classic example. He, he had an assistant. He had someone who could go through the mail probably in five minutes, but he was so immersed in the weeds, not just the trees, he was so immersed in the weeds that he really didn't see the forest because he was just down too low in the details. So when we begin to talk about detailed distraction, what is one of the most common symptoms that you can see of this? 
Here's a suggestion. Look at your church calendar. Look at where you are spending time. Is it possible that you have meetings because you've always had meetings and you've always had those times of meetings? Is it possible that you have committees because you've always had those committees, even if those committees don't have any function, but they still meet or they still feel like they're supposed to meet? Go look at your church calendar and ask this question. If we eliminated 50% of these things, would our church be worse or better or would the kingdom be worse or better as a result? Church calendar can be one of the most common places to find symptoms of detailed distraction. It's not that these are bad things. It's not that these are negative activities. It's that these are things that are taking us away from the best. Our church members are busy enough. Our lives are busy enough that we don't need to be focusing on the minutia to the detriment of what God has called us to do. Now, this is a very close cousin to another disease that I'll be talking to you about in about two more videos, and that's called activity acclimation. We'll get back to that in just a moment, but just, just to let you know, right now, activity acclimation means that our church has defined itself by how busy we are instead of what we are really doing for the kingdom of God. So these are close cousins, and there's obviously overlap. Here's a point that I want to make about detailed distraction. Work that is perceived to be important is accomplished while important work is neglected. There are only so many hours in a day. There's only so much that you can do. I remember one time consulting with a pastor, and he said he had no time whatsoever. And I said, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you for the next two weeks to give me a precise accounting of your week. There are 168 hours. Uh, you can put some down as family time, some as sleep, some as eating. And then other than those general categories, I want you to put down how you were spending your time. I want 168 hours accounted for for each of the next two weeks. Agreed? Agreed. I got back his accounting of what he was doing and I was blown away. He was spending 15 to 20 hours a week doing things that didn't really matter. In fact, if he eliminated those things, it not only would not be a negative, to use a double negative, it would have been a positive. And I suggested to him that he try for two weeks to eliminate those 15 hours. Think about 15 hours a week. Think, think about the impact upon that over 750 hours a year that would be given back to him for sermon preparation, for evangelistic witness, for getting to know people in the community. He was busy, but he wasn't busy doing the right things. He was involved in the details. And here's where we sometimes get blinded by this. You can have a church that is wonderfully organized, but it can still be a sick church because it has detailed distraction. I remember a church back in the old days when I was a pastor that had one of the most incredibly organized outreach programs and back in the days where you were really going house to house visiting and they had flashlights ready and they had accountability cards ready and they were all stacked together and oh, I was just envious when I, when I saw how organized their outreach ministry was. And then I looked at their shouldn't have maybe, but I looked at their baptismal records, the number of people who had come to Christ over the past year. And it may have been one, it may have been two, in a church running about seven or 800. They were so busy with details that they were disobedient to the Great Commission. The church on the surface can look organized and have its act together, but it's just in the weeds instead of doing the main thing. What causes this? Well, tradition, that can be one of the great causative factors. We used to do this, and so we're going to continue to do this because we did it in the past, and it's the way we've always done it, so we're going to do it in the future. Instead of constantly evaluating, is this something that we really need to continue doing? Two of the best questions that you can ask yourselves is, what do you need to do differently, and what do you need to stop doing? If churches would answer that question again and again, they would see that they could get themselves away from the details not to the detriment of organization, but of those details that are meaningless and that they could be making a difference on more important things. 
Folks, the reality of it is we have a great commission task. There are details that accompany it, but we can get so caught up in the minutia that we fail to do the mission. So it is my prayer for your church that as you have heard this, you will maybe begin to say, that's happening in my church, and we need to stop doing some things because we are too much in the details. I want to thank you for being here for our part of Rainer Report. Always great to have you. Again, we release these on Wednesday, so sometimes I'll say on this Wednesday, but I know many of you could be viewing this on different days. And always, I'm very thankful for Costco, the design bill firm, that's just making a difference in facilities across North America. If you have a building need, if you have a remodeling need, any type of facility need, I encourage you to contact the CEO, Tim Songster. Uh, you can reach him at this website, churchdesign.com. That's churchdesign.com. Thank you again for being here for the Rainer Report. Come back next week as we'll move from detailed distraction to, wow, institutional idolatry. I'll see you then.